Salon Taibin. Uh, we are so happy to uh, to be here this evening with the, the blessed visit of our beloved father, His Eminence Metropolitan Yusuf. Thank you, Sayyidina, for coming and bless uh, the little flock of St. Barbara uh, Shreveport. It's always our joy and happiness to see Sayyidina here coming and blessing us. Although it's a visit like every year or year and a half, yet we always feel it's a blessing and how uh, Sayyidina is coming to this place give us all joy and happiness. And of course, uh, the word of wisdom and benefit that we all enjoy from his teaching to us. Uh, thanks to God and Sayyidina, after giving the Bible study, we'll have some time for uh, just fellowship outside. And then also tomorrow, the liturgy, Sayyidina will bless us by praying the Holy Liturgy here with us. So I hope we all to be here and those also who couldn't make it for the Vespers, please encourage them that we see them tomorrow, God willing. Thank you, Sayyidina. Let's hear the word of wisdom from you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Bible study tonight from Psalm 126. The title of the psalm, A Song of Ascents. Because they were reciting certain psalms when they are ascending Mount Zion, going to the temple, on the mountain. Like nowadays, when we come to the church, we pray certain psalms on our way to the church. And this tradition was taken from the uh, Jewish tradition. People, when they were going to the mountain, ascending the mountain to go to the temple to worship the Lord, they were actually reciting certain psalms. These psalms actually are 15 psalms, from Psalm 120 to 135, uh, sorry, 134, from 120 to 134, it's 15 psalms. So Psalm 126 actually is the seventh in the series of 15 psalms of pilgrims coming to Jerusalem. This psalm, when we read it, it seems to be composed after a great deliverance from oppression. That's why many believe it was likely composed after the exile. As you know, Israel went to exile for 70 years in Babylon, and they returned back to Jerusalem. So many commentators said, most probably this psalm was composed when they returned back from captivity in Babylon. That's why could be written during the time of Azra and Nehemiah period in gratitude for God's restoration and in prayer for a continuation of that work, continuation of this liberty that God granted them. Something it might have been composed by Haggai or Zechariah, who actually were in the same time also or by Ezra, according to others. This psalm actually is a prophetic psalm. What I mean also, also it refers to a historical event, but it is prophetic psalm. Because our Lord Jesus Christ, in his crucifixion, he delivered us from the captivity of Satan, and he gave us freedom. As the Lord said, unless the Son sets you free, you cannot be free. Uh, so when the Son sets us free, you will be truly free. So that's why this psalm may have a reference to the redemptive work of the Messiah. And also, again, a prophetic psalm about the return of the Jews in the latter days to believe in Christ. As we read in Romans chapter 11, at the end of the days, many Jews actually will become Christian and they will believe in the Messiah. It is another son of Zion. Zion, when Zion is mentioned in the psalm or referred to Zion, uh, for example here in verse 1, when the Lord brought back 
the captivity of Zion. The first Psalm of Zion was Psalm 125. Then the second Psalm of Zion is Psalm 126. And Zion is a common theme throughout the remainder of these 15 Psalms, the Psalms of the Ascents. Mount Zion is a symbol of Jerusalem because the temple was built on this mount, which itself represented the place where God dwells with his people. So Mount Zion is a symbol of Jerusalem, symbol of the church of the new covenant, symbol of my heart and your heart, because you are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit abides in you. So when we read Zion, Zion historically refers to the temple of Solomon on the Mount Zion, but symbolically it refers to the church, any church in the new covenant, and also to your heart. You are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit abides in you. Psalm 126 is a psalm that looks back to when captives returned to Jerusalem following their long exile in Babylon, 70 years in Babylon. They had suffered so much in Babylon, and now they suddenly found themselves back in their homeland, back in Jerusalem, back in the beloved city of God. Unexpectedly and without much difficulty, God had delivered them without war, without any uh, ransom. Just Cyrus uh, made a decree that all Jews return back to their home city, Jerusalem. The psalm is beautiful and highly descriptive of the circumstances of the restoration of the Jews to Jerusalem. And the general thought of the psalm resembles that of Psalm 85, and also, it's a sign like Jeremiah 31, when the believers recall the salvation help of the Lord, bringing them from the captivity and rescued them from tribulation and famine. According to the New King James Bible version, the title of the psalm, A Joyful Return to Zion, a song of ascent. So it carries a powerful message of both joy and hope. That's why we need the sun during time of crisis. It will give us hope and joy. It's a sign that encourages us to rejoice in the Lord for his past faithfulness with us. And also to hope, to hope for more rejoicing because of God's future faithfulness. It is a much-needed reminder of how God began bringing his people from tears to joy, from tears to joy. It is a short psalm, only six verses. The, from verse 1 to 3, joy beyond expression. Verse 4, a prayer for continued deliverance. 5 and 6, time of sadness and time of joy. Let's read verse 1, 2, and 3. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. It was like dream. Then, what happened? Our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Even the non-Jewish people testify, the Lord has done great things for them. Verse 3 is a repetition. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Verse 2, what the nation said. Verse 3, what they are saying, the same words. So the first two verses of the psalm leads us into atmosphere of exaltation. People were laughing, 
celebrating the recent freedom and songs of joy were on their lips. So the psalmist sang for a time when God set his people free from their captivity and they were restored to Jerusalem, Zion. Most scholars associate this with the return, as I explained, from exile under Ezra and Nehemiah. But other commentators said it is possible that this psalm describes David's return from his brief exile from Jerusalem uh, in Absalom, his son, Absalom's school. The Jews had been exiled to Babylon 70 years earlier. 70 years is a long time. The people had settled down in Babylon and had established home in the new land. And some of them had been born in exile. It was all they knew. Then suddenly, suddenly, Cyrus, the new king, made a proclamation allowing all the Jews to go home, as we read in Azra chapter 1, from verse 1 to 4. They dreamed of returning one day, although they could hardly imagine how that might be possible. It was just a dream. So the reference clearly is to those who were returning to Zion. And the Psalmist fixes his eyes on them as returning. And he's describing their condition on returning back to, to Zion. And immediately says, it was the Lord who had thus restored them. It was the Lord. The Lord has done great things for them. Because it was like dream. We were like those who dream. Cyrus proclaimed liberty to God's captive, and yet it was the Lord's doing, according to his word, many years before. The Lord has done great things to his people. Why we say it is the Lord? Why we don't credit Cyrus for it? Although it was Cyrus, that liberated the Jews after so long a captivity, but he was prompted, prompted to it by God. For he did it at the very time Jeremiah prophesied it would be done after 70 years. When you read the prophecy of Jeremiah, Jeremiah actually prophesied that after 70 years they will be restored. So this was planned by God. And Cyrus himself, Cyrus himself, confirmed that he got his power and command from heaven. On releasing the, the captives, Cyrus said he got his power and command from heaven. And that he got an order from heaven to let the people go and to build the temple in Jerusalem. Also, it could not be expected that any king would let so many thousand captives go free without the smallest ransom. Just go back home, and that's it. And not only dismisses them, but Cyrus loaded them with presents on their departure. Never happens in history. Had he not felt himself constrained to it from above. So it was God actually who made this decision. And Cyrus was just the executor. God put in Cyrus to execute the restoration of Israel. That's why they said, we were like those who dream. The Jews had experienced 70 long years in captivity. And then in a moment, God turns things around. They were in shock. They couldn't believe it. It was too good to be true. They were now back in Jerusalem. 
back in the holy city, back in Zion, the place where God dwells with his people because the temple was there. And it all felt like a dream. And here with power and beauty, the psalmist describes the sense of happiness, the sense of happy, grateful astonishment at the power and goodness of God in bringing back his people from the captivity of Zion. Yes, the people knew about the promises of restoration, but when the actual moment of restoration comes, it was an overwhelming, overwhelming experience. St. John Chrysostom tells us about two kinds of captivity. Good captivity and bad captivity, or evil captivity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, St. Paul said, bringing every thought into captivity to obedience to Christ. That's a good captivity. When every thought, you bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. But the evil captivity, when we are captive under sin. So the same psalm can be applied when God restores me, liberated me from a bad habit, from a sin that controls me, from a time of captivity to being away from God like the prodigal son. And St. John Chrysostom says, I beseech you, let us avoid its way with the captivity of sin. Fight against it without ever being reconciled to it. And once liberated from it, from the captivity of sin, remain at liberty. That's why the psalmist here in verse 4, he is actually praying for the continuation in liberty. This beyond words consolation is always felt by those who return to God through repentance. Those who return to God, they are joyful, they are happy. Despising the hopes of this world and abandoning all desires for the goods and pleasure of this world. They now know the value of being rescued from the captivity of the devil. They now know the enjoyment of the true freedom and everlasting peace through the call and guidance of God the Almighty. Also, the captivity may refer to those who were captive in Hades. On Good Friday, we recall how the Lord descended into the lower parts of the earth and restored our father Adam to the paradise of joy. So some of the father take this verse as telling of the wandering and joy of the apostles in the resurrection of Christ. After Christ had indeed brought back the captivity of Zion, when Christ first descended into the lower parts of the earth, into Hades, and brought the waiting patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their children with him into the joy of paradise. I mean children, the spiritual children, those who have walked in the steps of these great patriarchs. Other fathers take it as an historical application of the great peace of the Christian church when it emerged into permanent freedom from pagan oppression. As you know, in the first four centuries, Christianity was persecuted by the pagan, like Diocletian, until Emperor Constantine liberated all the Christians, opened the prisons, liberated them from being in captivity, in exile, and made Christianity the official religion of the empire. So this psalm also can be a prophetic psalm about this time. Maybe somebody will ask why they recited this psalm going to the temple. Why it is psalm of the psalms of ascents? Because the pilgrims making their way to Jerusalem each year for the feasts, the feast of Passover, 
Feast of the Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacle. What have been actually the pilgrims aware that this was the same route the captives had taken when they returned. So when they were climbing the mountain, it was the same route that the captives took when they returned from Babylon. And they would have marveled at God's graciousness in returning the captives to Zion. Interior joy will show itself externally, which it does by the expression of joy on faith. See verse 2. Then our mouth were filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. So, gladness on the face, on the tongue, singing, laughter. The captive experienced great sorrow and mourning in the exile. But now, by the amazing work of God, they were suddenly back in Zion. When they were actually in Babylon, let us read how their condition was. It is in Psalm 137. They said, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, of Babylon. For there those who carried us away captive asked for us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They were silent. They were not able to sing. They were sad. They were sorrowful. But now our mouth is filled with joy and our tongue with singing. Now as their heart were filled with joy, this was externally visible scene on their faces and expressed with their mouth and by outward gish. So their mouths were filled with laughter and songs of joy. By the way, at the end of the divine liturgy, after we take communion, Abuna prays this prayer inaudibly when he says, our mouth is filled with joy and our tongue with gladness concerning our partaking of uh, your holy body. And also this time, I forget to tell you, we prayed in the 11th hour of the Agbeya. In the 11th hour of the Agbeya. Joy is mentioned four times in this psalm. They were so full of joy that they could not contain themselves. They want to express their joy, and yet they could not find expression for it. The mercy of God was so unexpected, so amazing, that they could not do less than laugh. And they laughed much, so that their mouths were full of laughing. And that because of their hearts were full of joy. St. Augustine says, This mouth of brethren, given to us by the Lord, we should fill it with spiritual joy and praise, and not with food, drink, or vain talk. St. Augustine also says, Guard the mouth of your heart from evil, and you will be innocent. The tongue of your body will be innocent. Your hands will be innocent. Even your feet will be innocent. Your eyes, your ears will be innocent. All your members will serve under righteousness, because a righteous commander has your heart. So if God actually has your heart, your tongue, your eye, your feet, everything will be innocent. Then shall they say among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. As we read, the nations, the pagan, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people said the Lord has done great things for them. So the sense of joyful amazement was not limited only to the people of God, but surrounding nations had to proclaim that the work belonged to the Lord, this work belonged to the Lord, and that the work was truly great. Their deliverance in the circumstances was such evidently to have been the work of God. Because I told you, just Cyrus released them without any 
any conditions without a little or small strength. So the psalmist heard what the nation said in verse 2, agreed with it, and emphasized it with repetition and personalized it in verse 3. After said, the nation said, the Lord has done great things for us, for them. Now he is repeating it by his own mouth. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad, we are happy, we are joyful. It became the declaration of what God had done for us. According to St. John Chrysostom, the repetition of verse 3 and verse 2 does not occur without point. It is to highlight the great joy they had. As if they are saying, the Lord has done great things for us, therefore we are glad. For these great things they rejoice and give thanks to God. And even right now, a surrounding world may see a change in a man, in his repentance from sin, in his comfort, in his calmness and peace. And they say that the, that the Lord has done great things for him. I, I heard it many times when people repent and return to God. Then friends tell them, what's happening with you? We see you are different now. You are more peaceful. You are more calm. You are happy. What happened to you? That is the fruit of the deliverance from the captivity of sin. That's why the person himself who repented, while he responds most, most fully to what they say, will see this more clearly than they do. And he will say, and I am glad. I am glad. They see him as happy, but he confirmed that I am glad. This is more in his redemption. He is glad in his redemption. His peace, joy, then they can perceive. And with emphasis, he himself will say, the Lord has done great things for me. Yes, they see him calm, peaceful, joyful, but what he is experiencing is more than what they perceive. There is nothing that so fills the mind with joy as true repentance and returning back to God. The nations were only audience and viewers and spoke of it only as matter of news. They were not participant in that matter, in this joy. But the people of God spoke of it as sharers and partakers in the joy. Some father says that these words apply most fitly to the departed who are faithful. When they actually are released from the captivity of the world and go to the paradise of joy, they will say, the Lord has done great things to us and we are glad. That's why St. Paul said, I have desire to depart and be with Christ. This is far better. Now they are at rest delivered out of Babylon of this world and became citizens of that happy city, heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem above. Verse 4, I told you verse 4, is a prayer for continuous uh, liberty. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. The second half of this psalm does not deny the amazed joy of the first half, but it recognizes that there is still work yet to be done. The returning captives under Azra or David realized that there was much work yet to do, and the restoration had only yet begun. Like a person who was addicted, for example, to drugs, and now he has done the detox, and now he is sober. He is celebrating this freedom. But again, there is more work to be done. If he was not watchful, he will relapse. In the same way, they realize that there are more work to be done. 
The psalmist now thinks of the many captives still dispersed among the nations and pray for another manifestation of divine, of divine favor and power. Our captivity, the majority of whom are still in the land of the stranger, because people went to Babylon, but others dispersed. In the same way, when a sinner returned, he returned to God, there are other sinners still in the captivity of Satan. That's why the sinner who repented and restored back to the church of God, he is praying, bring back our captivity, the rest of our brethren who are still captive under sin, O Lord, at the streams in the south. So bring them back at once, as quickly as the streams in the south. Stream cells rush very fast. So bring them back quickly and in short time. South was the unfer unfertile dry region to the south of Judah, where in summer all the streams dry up and are only filled by autumn rains. So the illusion is to the sudden filling of the dry channels of the southern part of the land in a rainy season. Because these are very dry during the summer. And then with the rain in the fall, it's filled quickly. So if these dry land are filled quickly because of the streams in the south, restore the captives in the same way. So the psalmist prays that floods of the return may pour into the desolate and deserted country. As God brings back after the autumn rains, plenty streams to the dry channels of the south part of the country. Thus far, the restoration of Israel has been only as it were an insufficient sparse thread of water dripping among the stones. But now he's looking for streams. Returning of one sinner is like one, one person returned. What about the rest of the people who are still living, prodigal living? So want them to come and return back to the church. As in the due season, God refills those stony streams with abundance of rushing water, so God can revive and renew the feeble community of Israel with fresh and vigorous life and multiply its small numbers into crowds which the prophet's vision saw streaming in uh, to Jerusalem. The church, without having all her children inside the church, will be like a weak community. That's why we are, we are praying that God may fill the church again with all these lost souls and come back like the streams in the sun. The prophecy in, in Isaiah 49 verse 18 says, Lift up your eye, look around and see, all these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourself with them all as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. So all these captives will return back, will gather together and come to you, come to Jerusalem, come to the church of God. So the psalmist prayed for a mighty, certain work of God to further the work of restoration among his people. If the captives on their return prayed to God so earnestly, what amount of earnestness will not be required of us still exiles as we are? So, the captives on returning, they prayed to God with earnestness. 
then we who are still captive in, in the land of, of captivity, who are in Zion, we need to pray actually with more earnestness that God restore us back to his church. For though some have got home, some sinners repented, yet many are still in exile on the road, and many are still settled to the captivity and become so attached to the things of, the, of this world that they do not give, in, give even a thought on their real home heaven. Some people, they love the land of captivity, they are blind, they don't want to come back to the church to, to, to be in, in relationship with God. Therefore, the citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem, the believers, the true believers, and those who are on pilgrimage in the Babylon of this world, like us, those in heavenly Jerusalem, the saints in paradise, and those in pilgrimage in Babylon of this world, like us, the believers here, having the first fruit of the Spirit, pray for their deliverance out of bondage, and for the return of all unbelievers to the field. According to St. Augustine, this sound wind, south wind, is the Holy Spirit himself, of whom is written in the Song of Solomon, Awake, O north wind, and O come, O south, blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out. So, the Holy Spirit will make this restoration of the non-believers and the sinners back to the Church of God, like the souls, the, like the streams in the south. St. Augustine says, this psalm means that the rain pours after the warm south wind blows, as a reference to the Holy Spirit sought by the heart, that became hardened like snow. So when our heart are hardened like snow, but once, the warmth of the Holy Spirit dissolves the snow accumulated in it, tears will flow like rain from the arms, and the person will be restored. The last two verses. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So, the joy of the first half of the psalm was real, but this joy was only part of the picture. With wisdom, the psalmist remind himself and all of us that great joy is often preceded by a season of tears, as if they are seeds we sow that will bring a crop of joy to be later reaped. If the student did not study hard, he will not actually enjoy his success. If Christ did not go to the cross, we will not celebrate the resurrection. If the farmer did not labor uh, in, in, in planting the, the, the ground, he will not rejoice in the time of reaping. So having asked God to bring back all the captives to their country, he now addresses the captives themselves and exhorts them not to be discouraged by the labor of their journey or to be restrained by regard of any property they may have acquired in a foreign land. Because sometimes, no, we, we acquire this property in Babylon. How can we leave it? So maybe they will stay in Babylon because of the properties they acquired there. Sometimes we continue in the land of sin because of some enjoy or some, some pleasures or some privilege we, we, we got while we were in the land of sin. So he compares 
vind tot die soor en verriepe. Zou een ordinere lief dat is woord in grief en sorrow, in labor. Being obliged to put his seed into the ground, without having any certainty of ever getting the smallest return of it, maybe there will be very difficult weather, snow, or very hot weather, and the whole, the whole uh, crop can, can, can be gone. And therefore seems to labor, and to tire himself in order to lose what he has. But when the harvest comes, he reaps with great joy when he sees the corn that to all appearance was lost is now, instead of being lost, returned to him with an enormous increase. He buries the seeds in the ground. He doesn't see them, and he doesn't know what will happen to them. But when the time of harvest he rejoices. Though the sowing of seed is a work of labor and sorrow, yet the return, the harvest, is accompanied with rejoicing. The effort of the returned captives to reestablish the nation in Jerusalem had been carried on in the midst of difficulty and anxieties, fears, but the Psalms cannot doubt that they will in due time bear fruit. If you read the book of Nehemiah, when they start to build Jerusalem and to build the walls of Jerusalem and to restore the temple, many challenges, many difficulties faced them. But they continued. Nehemiah said, God of heaven will give us uh, success and we as children will rise up and build. The tears shed at the foundation of the second temple and the rejoicing at its completion and at the dedication of the walls were only illustration of the truth. As the Lord said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. A common expression encouraging faith in prayer, whether in a literal or spiritual sense. It's the same when you go through the narrow gate, you walk the difficult way, you will rejoice in the second coming of Christ. Praying or seeking the Lord is sowing in righteousness, which is often associated with tears and weeping, and the result is not always seen soon. Sometimes we don't see the result until the second coming of Christ. They are like seeds, lie buried under the cloth, but take effect and will rise up in due time. Believers should wait patiently at the farmer for the fruits of the earth. In due time, they will produce a larger crop of blessing, a plentiful harvest, which the praying believer will reap with joy. In verse 4, he gave an image of sudden filling of the dry channels and result of sudden the results are sudden and unearned. But in verse, verse 5, he gave another image of the harvest after difficult work of plowing and sowing seed. The result comes only after a long period of hard work and waiting. So the two images are complementary to each other. Verse 4 about grace. Verse 5 about work. And both are complementing each other. So the first of them, verse 4, is all suddenness, an absolute gift from heaven, grace. The second is slow and difficult, where men given a crucial part to play in it. That's our work. This illustration puts a connection between the tears and the joy. Some may want to reap the joy without ever having sown the tears. We want to be in the Mount of Transfiguration, but we, we sleep in the Mount of Gethsemane. According to Saint John Chrysostom, what rain is to the seed, tears are to those in tribulation. Like how the rain makes the seed actually produce fruit, in the same way tears actually will make our tribulation turn into joy. So this applies to us pilgrims of this world. 
For those who are content with their captivity, they don't want to fight, and are so engaged by the love of this world, never think on their country heaven. While the true captive make all the haste they can to go back to their home above. They freely give to the poor, they labor in teaching their brethren as the apostles did. They freely renounce all manner of pleasures of this world. In reality, it is sowing in tears that they may afterward in due time reap in joy. St. Augustine says, In this life, which is full of tears, let us sow. What shall we sow? Good works. Works of mercy are our seeds, of which seeds the apostle says, And let us now grow, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Many church fathers think that the meaning here is the abundant reward and joy of the righteous in the second coming of the Son of Man. When the sower who sowed the good seed of the Word of God in the field of this world triumphs finally over the secret enemy who sowed the tears. See? When the sorrow of exile here shall be compensated by the joy of restoration to our home. And the idea in verse 5 is repeated with more illustration in verse 6, with wider meaning. The Psalms now describe at greater length the process of sowing and reaping. Those who have endured much weeping, if they truly carry, carry it as seed for sowing, Holding and casting it with faith in God and in His promise, those may be assured of reaping a good harvest. Because he, he said here, shall doubtless, without any doubt, come again with rejoicing. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless, without any doubt, come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him. So the captive in Babylon were long sowing in tears, but at the last they were brought forth with joy. The captives in Babylon reaped the benefit of their patient suffering and brought their sheaves with them to their own land and their experiences of the goodness of God to them. All the righteous, like Job, Joseph, David, and many others, had harvest of joy after a sorrowful season. Tears truly sown in faith will bring in time a true harvest of rejoicing. As if the reapers held heavy sheaves of grain. He continually goes forth weeping will be abundantly rewarded for all his toil. He will see the fruit of his labors. He will be filled with joy. This is a powerful and great promise that our tears and sorrows will not be wasted, but they are sown for a joyful harvest received in a better season. So the purpose of this illustration in verse 6 was to cheer the hearts of the exiles in their long and dangerous journey to their native land, returning back. It has, however, a wider and more universal application as being suited to encourage all of us in our endeavors to secure our own salvation and to do good in this world, for the effort is often tied and associated with sacrifice, toil, and tears. The work of repentance means a lot of tears. Psalm 56, verse 8, You number my wandering, put my tears into your bottle, as they not in your, are they not in your book? God keeps a record 
of all his children tears. God keep track of all their tears. And one day, God himself will personally wipe the tears from our eyes. As we read in Revelation 21 verse 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. St. Augustine says, although we saw in tears, yet shall we reap in joy. For in that resurrection of the dead, second coming of Christ, each man shall receive his own sheaves. What are the sheaves here? The produce of his seed, the crowns of joy and of delight. Then will there be a joyous triumph when we shall laugh at death wherein we groaned before. Usually with death, people grieve and cry. But in the resurrection, then these tears will be turned into that. So the great lesson on the mystery of life, life's fruitfulness, that suffering can contain, that suffering can contain is very strong in this song. So, suffering will lead to glory. Tears will replaced by joy. As the Lord Jesus Christ said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So we need to suffer. We need to carry our cross. We need to shed tears. We need to work hard. We need to labor in order to reap with joy. St. John Chrysostom said, let us thank the Lord both for the tribulation and for the relief, for both. Different though they are, tribulation and relief, after all, they each have one end in view, like sowing and harvesting, tribulation and relief, sowing and harvesting. Let us bear tribulation generously and gratefully and relieve with words of praise. This concludes Psalm 126. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Do you have any comments or questions on this song? سيدنا ربنا هو بيفتك uh, was a great lesson to learn من سيدنا يمكن بس just uh, one small comment as you saw uh, Psalm of six verses how deep سيدنا went through it which is يعني a good lesson for all of us to pay that much attention to the word of God it has a lot of treasures we can dig deep as سيدنا did to, uh, tonight Inshallah, tomorrow the liturgy uh, will start I know we used to start at nine but we're gonna start little earlier, at least 15 minutes earlier, there will be ordination of little children to children. So we need to finish by 11.30 because Sayyidna still traveling by, uh, with us back by driving and has a very long day tomorrow for consecration of St. George's Church in uh, Arlington. It will be an overnight prayer. And then he will be uh, traveling with us back to Dallas so barely we'll get a couple of hours to rest. Rabbana Atak Sayyidna, we'll see you tomorrow inshallah morning. We'll start in the Psalms prayer at 9.15 exactly. So we can, as I said, finish the liturgy by 11.30. God will. Amen.
Christ, give me a gift of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Go in peace, may the peace of the Lord be 